Hello, party people, and welcome to Jokasar Lawn. I'm probably butchering that. Glacial Lagoon here in Iceland. It's one of my favorite places in Iceland. There's a glacier way back behind me, and all day long, little pieces of that glacier are breaking off. And they're trying to make it out to the ocean through a little river that I'm going to show you during my next office hours, show you Diamond Beach. They're trying to make it out through a river through the ocean, but during high tide, all the water's pushing back in from the ocean. So all these little uh, icebergs gather here in the lagoon being held in by the, the river by the tide and then when the tide goes out, which is going to happen here in about half an hour, which is why I'm here now, when the tide goes out all these little icebergs make a run for the ocean. It's just so cute. I just love it. Now the first couple of times I was here I didn't understand how the tides influenced what you saw here and I was just like oh sometimes the lagoon is full of icebergs and sometimes it's empty but now that I know it it's just so exciting to see. So let's, while I'm waiting for the tide to uh, start to go out, let's take some of your top voted questions from Polgab. Let's see, the number one question is from Ollie the DBA. Ollie says, I hear clustering is dumb and complex on Azure infrastructure as a system all the time. I hear this from non-DBAs, he says. One can only assume they hate high availability and disaster recovery. Ali. I agree. What was it that they were saying? Dumb and complex. I think clustering is dumb and complex. And I love high availability and disaster recovery, but it's still just not intuitive. It breaks all the time. It's complicated to set up. Whereas if you look at our competitions, what some of the NoSQL platforms are able to do, they have such an easier time with disaster recovery. So, Ali, I, I think they're actually right. Now, if clustering seems easy and powerful to you, that's great. You're a professional database administrator. You've got lots of experience. You're very good at doing your job. But just be aware that it doesn't seem so easy to someone else. And probably the best way I could explain that is try to teach it to them. Sit down to someone who doesn't know SQL Server clustering and set up a cluster from start to finish. Then fail it over. Then step aside and have them do the exact same thing and break a part of their cluster. Take something in there, break an IP address, break a share piece of shared storage, and watch them try to troubleshoot it, and it's way harder than it looks. Next up, let's see, Ozan asks, Hi Brent, do you prefer, let me make sure this actually goes on to uh, the question recorder here. He says, do you prefer to access external data via linked server or via polybase? Um, Ozan, my personal experience is, is you shouldn't be doing with the database server. That's what the application should connect to the SQL server that has the database or has the data that it needs. That's not the database's server jo server's job to be some kind of data conductor to move things around. He follows up with, what is your experience with Polybase? Terrible. I tried to set it up several times and I was just horrified by how uh, inconvenient it was, how bad the performance was. Uh, it doesn't cache data. It'll go and get, get data from the target servers over and over again, even if nothing's changed. If 10 queries run simultaneously, they ask for the data 10 different times from that external server. It's just a recipe for bad performance. Jag asks, when I'm trying to avoid blocking, is the read past hint better than no lock? Jag, that's a really good question. Read past will simply skip any locked rows. No lock will read them, but it may see changes that were never committed. So it's up to you with what your queries need. Would you rather skip data that's currently being in the process of modified, or would you like to read it, but on the chance that you might see changes that were never committed? No lock has other problems too. It'll read rows twice, it'll skip rows altogether, and your query can fail. So it's up to you with which problems with your uh, uh, query results you're willing to accept. Next up, Xavier asks, what are the top issues your clients run into when deploying Power BI Gateway? 
I can't tell you for this, the purpose of my clients because I don't do any consulting on Power BI, but I'll tell you what my own problems have been with the Power BI gateway. If you really want redundancy, you're going to have to, or, or high availability for it, you're going to have to install several of them. And then when there's a problem with one, the reporting is really bad on Microsoft's side. It doesn't tell you which IP address it is. Uh, I've had uh, issues where the Power BI gateway, I couldn't get rid of it on a box. I've had issues where it failed and it didn't tell me. So it, the, the manageability of it's kind of painful. Next up, Jerry Mathers asks, what is your opinion of dBeaver working for SQL Server VM? I've never used it, and it's nothing against it, but here's my thing with third-party applications for SQL Server. In my work, I'm an emergency performance tuner, and so clients will be like, come in here, you have 48 hours to turn this SQL Server around. And I can't usually install third-party stuff to just do things like Management Studio or Azure Data Studio could do. I just have to work with whatever they've got. 99.9% .9 of the time, the only thing that the client's got is Management Studio or Azure Data Studio. So I just don't have experience with those third-party tools. Next up, Wally asks, should Azure drives that host SQL Server's VM data be formatted with 4K, 8K, or 64K block size? So this mattered a lot back in on-premises days when you had a dedicated set of disks that were used for one specific SQL Server and we would do all this benchmarking and baselining. These days with cloud storage, all cloud storage is really random access. You're sharing the storage at the same time as other people are using it. Lots of your databases are active at the same time. Lots of SQL servers are active at the same time. Lots of their clients are active at the same time. I don't think it's really going to make that much of a difference one way or another which one you do. I still do 64K out of habit, but it's been easily 10 years since I benchmarked it. Because even if it did make a difference, even back when we were testing, it was like a 5-10% difference. It wasn't the kind of thing that would get you across the finish line. If you're having to hit disk these days, you're kind of screwed regardless. Next up, Shiraz asks, during the building of a new SQL Server, when should you run SP Blitz? That's an interesting question. I would run it whenever you think it's ready to go live. If you think you've done a good job of setting up that SQL Server and you think it's ready to go live, man, there are a lot of bugs out here today. You think there, it's ready to go live? Go run SP Blitz and get a second opinion just to make sure. And often I've seen folks find things that they're like, oh, I didn't know I did that. Next up, Ollie the DBA asks, Hi Brent, do you see a use case for Azure Platform as a Service if you have a team of four experienced DBAs? Oh, that's an interesting question. I, I don't think that the staff count really has anything to do, there it goes, uh, I don't think that the staff count really has anything to do with whether or not Azure Platform as a Service is right for you. I think that those two things are just kind of unrelated. It's like saying, what color of a car should I buy uh, if I need carpet floor mats? Those, those two things are, you can get carpet floor mats in any color car. He says, I'm at a 500 server shop about to embark on our Azure journey and we prefer performance over cost savings. So you've already lost me there because if you prefer performance over cost savings, why are you going to the cloud? If you're used to high performance local storage and if you're used to high performance shared storage, you're gonna be pretty bummed out by what you get in the cloud. If you're used to not having noisy neighbors, you're gonna be pretty bummed at what you get by the cloud. So I would question your beginning assumptions there. Hate to break that to you. Ooh, Analyze ask, does RPO and RTO numbers usually improve when I'm migrating for log shipping from log shipping to always on availability groups? Meaning, do I go down less often and lose less data when I move from log shipping to availability groups? In my experience, availability groups is usually deployed by people who, secret time, don't know what they're doing. 
And because of that, they're continuously surprised by how often availability groups breaks and how long it takes them to troubleshoot it when it does break. What I'll say is if you do a good job at it, your RPO and RTO should decrease. You should be able to lose less data and get back online faster. But if you do a bad job at it, it's a lot easier to screw up availability groups than it is to screw up log shipping. Matab asks, what test applications do you like to run on prospective new SQL servers for CPU network and disk performance? For me, backups and restores. El numero uno, the very big one that I love to run, is simple backup and restore and compare those to the existing SQL server that you are on. Very often, the new SQL servers don't even back up or restore as quickly as the original SQL servers. And at that point, we can start digging in and going, all right, where's the problem? Is it a CPU problem? Is it a storage problem, a network problem, or what? And we'll do one more question. Izzy asks, I enjoy how you relate technical problems to everyday ex experiences. Why, thank you. He says, did you have to learn this or does it come naturally? Oh, that, that's a good question. I've been teaching for God, over 20 years now, got started in the hotel and restaurant business. When you work in hotels and restaurants, you have to train people continuously. You're always getting new wait staff, new bus staff, new cooks, new front desk clerks, you name it. And so you have to be able to train them in terms of things that they already know. You have to build on life experiences that they already have. So I got started way back in that with like hotels and restaurants that I needed to find things that I could communicate to as widespread of an audience as possible as quickly as possible. And that's where I uh, started learning that technique. Well, all right, so there's our first round of questions for the morning. The tide is getting ready to go out, so uh, all these beautiful icebergs are going to start uh, making their way out to the sea here shortly. One of the ways that you can tell is that the water's like still as glass. Uh, when I first got here about an hour, hour and a half ago, there were waves coming in like this, but now that the water's kind of at stasis, and the water's getting ready to go out. You've been looking at uh, the glaciers for a while. Let's turn the camera, and I'm gonna show you the river. Take me to the river, do, 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 do. So over there is the ocean. So the, when the tide turns, all these icebergs are going to start heading out down underneath that bridge. And you can see that there's still some icebergs over there from the last tide. And this is really interesting, at least to me, and I'm kind of a dork, but that, that doesn't have unlimited depth there. It's only, <coughs> goodness, excuse me. It's only so deep right there in the channel that goes out to the sea. So some of the bigger icebergs, they get stuck on the bottom. And as the water comes in and out, it gradually erodes these icebergs back down to nothing. And then they'll go tumbling out uh, uh, at the next tide as well. It's really neat to see. It can be kind of dramatic at times, uh, back and forth too as well. Um, so the next office hours that you see, I'm actually going to be at a beach out there uh, with these little icebergs that have floated out to sea. There's a beautiful black sand beach called Diamond Beach where these icebergs then wash up because they get hit by the ocean waves. Uh, they wash up and so you can sit on little icebergs. People get their pictures taken with them. They uh, uh, carry them. It's all kinds of cute stuff. Has even been funny. Uh, a couple of few years ago, there was a woman, I want to say she was from China, was sitting on one of the little icebergs on the beach to get her picture taken, and a wave came in and started washing her out to sea. She had to be rescued because she was floating out to sea on a little iceberg. It's kind of funny. Um, if you want to learn more about this, this is Joka Sarlon, J O K, J O K U S A R L O. O -N. Why am I spelling it out to you? I can just put it in the video description and then you can go watch it. So I will see y'all in the next office hours. Adios.